Today, as a slight diversion on my Waggler series, I want to talk about something that's bandied around all the time, uh, and that is the lift method. And you'll also see floats called wind beaters and drift beaters. And the two sort of combining into something sort of tench lifters floats and stuff like this. And it's all very mysterious to me. So I've done a bit of uh, poking around, looked up the old books and uh, see if we can uh, throw some light on this interesting subject. The lift method is a method that goes back probably at least a hundred years and at its simplest it was just someone fishing a very small float, probably a piece of a crow quill, attached bottom end only, just a, a short a little piece of crow quill and the modern equivalent would be a little piece of peacock quill like this bottom end only with a single shot just an inch or two from the hook and this method grew up on the river Lee uh, north of London where people would anchor a, a little tiny piece of crust because crust is so buoyant it's going to tend to float up off the, you know hard to get it to sink so by putting a BB or a triple A shot very close to the hook you'd get this float make sure the float wasn't very big just a bit of crow quill pe later peacock quill and so that when the fish took the bait and lifted that bottom shot the float float would just lay flat or it would just slide away go under and that method was don't even know what they called it, a sort of shot ledger using it quite a small shot, a BB or a treble A shot. Now an angler from Buckinghamshire, Fred J Taylor, who came to prominence in the 50, 1950s, did tench fishing on some uh, quite large lakes and they found that come August, though early season tench fishing was quite easy, the fish just towed away any old float, the tench got quite sort of fussy, they needed smaller baits and the bites were quite shy, they're quite fiddly, that the tench just sort of feed around, hardly moving the float, none of the great big towaways they'd got back in uh, late June. So Fred J Taylor was aware of this, this sort of lift method from the River Lee, it was documented uh, by various writers in the 1930s so that it was known it's very simple with float fishing people experiment they take floats they try different shotting patterns they try attaching it top and bottom bottom end only they move the shot around it's that's what float fishing is about you just experiment you you don't have to be rigid in how you fish and so he took this method this existing method and he took a, a bigger piece of quill, more like this bit, and he put a swan shot, again very close to the hook, and used the lift, the lift method, and, and he popularised it, and he put it in a book called Angling in Earnest, which came out in the 1950s and stayed in print for quite a few years after that, and he wrote about it in fishing articles as well in the, in the press. And if you want to make a float like this, when in the old days they, they literally cut off a piece of peacock quill, there's no varnish on it, and they just put a tight piece of valve rubber on the bottom. These floats here, I, I knocked these up the other day, they've just got a bit of cane aerodited into the bottom, and I've put uh, an eye on there, which is just a bit of uh, 18 pound fishing line whipped on with some 10 pound fishing line. It's that, that simple, and you can put the line through a piece of uh, float rubber and through the eye so if the float rubber does break you've got it and then that float will trim down with that weight you need you can push it up and down easily you've got no locking shot so when the weight's not on there it will lay flat so you get these bites now I did try that on Friday on a, a local commercial fishery and there were lots of carp in there small carp like most commercials between a couple of pounds and I think the biggest was about seven or eight pounds and quite frankly <laughs> it was one of the most useless methods I've ever done. The, the carp were feeding 
really strongly and I, I had a fairly buoyant expander pellet about an eight millimetre on a, a 12 hook and the float bobbed and dibbed and went under and they were very good at dropping that bait and I was missing bite after bite and uh, my cameraman mate was sort of setting up the cameras and not fishing and I said I'll get on and do some fishing and he set up a very very simple waggler rig with a, a small waggler with an insert with just a, I think a number six or a number four, so eight inches from the hook. We're only talking about fishing in two and a half, three foot of water. And he started to catch carp far quicker than I don't think I'd even had a fish while he was still tackling up after about an hour. And then eventually I started to get a few carp and we had half a dozen each, which was nothing on there. But so this lift method might be talked about a lot, but is it really any good? I'm not sure it is. The reason I say that is that if you go looking in the match fishing books and match anglers will play around with float rigs until they get it right. They, they're good at a lot of match anglers historically have been very good at making floats. They design floats. They'll change, chop them, hack them around, try different shotting patterns. They'll try things that may not work in practice outside of matches. They will look for it. And the match fishing books I've got, Kevin Asher's, all of Billy Lane's, Ivan Marks, Alan Haynes, who was a, a match angler from Peterborough and worked for Angling Tides for many years. He did two very good books float, on float fishing and match fishing. Um, Jim Baxter's fantastic book, The Rising Antenna. Lift methods, not a mention, not a dicky bird about it. If it was any good, the match anglers would use it. They don't. So that's the first clue that something's not quite right with this so-called lift method. If you want to use it, keep it simple. You could put a coat of varnish on this. You could paint the tip all pretty. Play around this fishing. There's no, there's no hard and fast rule, but don't expect some miracle method. Now for the second part of the history lesson. In the 1960s, gravel pit fishing started to become uh, more available and Peter Stone who knew Fred J Taylor and became friends with Dick Walker as well he lived just north of Oxford at Wolvercut I think I believe he sort of born in born lived in and died at the same house in Wolvercut and there were gravel pits not far from his home and they started to fish these pits in the 60s and unlike the, the sort of natural waters that Fred J. Taylor fished, these were deeper and they were big and open. There weren't any trees on these early gravel pits, that, so you had a lot of big waves on there. And there was some very, very good tench. I've got a feeling um, Peter Stone had one of about £10 in probably the very early 70s, which was all, almost unheard of back then. Um, so they had some good fishing. Now, if you go back to 1960s float fishing, people were starting to use antenna floats and these were made with cork bodies and, and balsa bodies with cane antennas. And amongst the fads that came out was, we're gonna talk about this float properly, but was to have a body somewhere on the, the antenna, but not at the tip. So a, a double bodied antenna float and another Oxford angler called Bill Taylor, who wasn't related to Fred J. Taylor, as far as I know, he describes these twin bodied floats and maybe using them on the Thames. The gravel pit fishing that um, Peter Stone did was, Bill Taylor had moved somewhere else. He was a teacher, so he, he went to an, a, a school in another part of the country before Peter Stone got onto this sort of fishing. But they, they knew each other and Fred J. Taylor Anyway, Peter Drennan, who was developing floats in the 60s and a, a friend of Peter Stone's, Peter Stone started to fish these pits and with that undertow as you get on a windy pit, he wanted to get the bait to stay still on the bottom. And with an antenna float, they'd, they'd put a big shot on the bottom, a bulk shot wasn't locked like a waggler, the bulk shot would be well down the line, so almost like an Avon float rig with a bulk shot sort of three or four foot above the hook and then a big shot six inches from the hook 
hard on the bottom, a sort of treble A or a swan shot. And with the toe and the, the waves, having a very thin antenna meant that the waves could bounce up and down without bouncing the float up and down because the antenna is very thick, very little buoyancy in a thin antenna. And we're talking two millimeters or less, one and a half millimeters. But with, with a nice bulbous sight tip to spot in the waves and the buoyancy in it, that would resist being pulled under. So the waves are going down, but it's not being pulled under. And then when they got a bite, they would get a great big lift bite. That was the theory. And these floats, are still around. Uh, Peter Drennan's company, Drennan International, still make them as do other companies. And again, the match anglers have never really, never really bought into this idea. But if you want to fish with one, use it, fair enough. But the important thing is that the antenna is thin, less than two millimeters, one and a half millimeters, and the the tip is buoyant. I think the original ones were probably a section of thick peacock quill like the lift float so they, they'd have an inch or so of really thick peacock speared onto the and glued onto the, the very thin cane antenna which was an easy way of making a, a, a bulbous tip that was sort of five or six millimeters thick. These have probably got, a, uh, I don't know if it's a piece of balsa, balsa wood or something like that. So that's basically a, known as a drift beater or a wind beater. Now what has now come along is that anglers are, you will see on, on YouTube and Facebook, people talk about tench drifters as if the only way to fish for tench, even in old estate lakes with no big waves, no real tow, just the sort of place where you fish by the lilies, that they make a float sort of similar to this, but it's got a really thick antenna because it's probably made of three or even four millimeter cane. It's got a great big bulbous tip. It's whipped to within an inch of its life. So you've got all sorts of fancy whippings and paint jobs, pictures of albatrosses on it. I don't know what else. I think the fish have to go and have a look at the pictures on the float if they're gonna bite, I, I don't get it. And so you've got something that is the sort of worst of everything. It doesn't work as a drift beater, the tip, the thing's too thing. It's not very sensitive, got a great big bulbous tip. It doesn't cast very well because it's got a thick cane antenna, so that unbalances the float. And you think, someone's lost the plot here. So my advice, if you want to fish for tench, and I do like fishing for tench sometimes, but I fish on the pits, you stick to the good old standard peacock quill antennas with inserts. These vary, there's quite a small one there with a thin insert for shy bites. These are bigger ones uh, with thicker tips. The thickest is about three millimeter. And quite often on the, on the bigger bits there where you've got open water, you'll need one with a black tip, just an all black tip. This one's actually got one of my special hollow tips on it, but that could be a piece of um, peacock quill with a solid tip. And these work well for tench. And instead of that great big shot on the bottom, you fish three or four foot over depth when, when it's dragging through, but with three number eights spread out. And that will just slow it down. It doesn't stop it, but it slows it down and it goes through. And like I say, caught plenty of big tench fishing with these. And the bites, Forget lift, you don't get lift bite, it, it's down like this and it just eases away, nice and simple. And that's what float fishing is all about. So keeping it simple, not coming up with weird concoction floats. Forget about the lift method, this is crude. And all I can say is the carpet tobber weren't very impressed by it. Stick to proper wagglers, they cast better, they show bites better, they fish better. And any matchman would tell you, if it was any good, we'd use it. We don't. Hope I've got you thinking. Probably um, stood up a hornet's nest. Hey ho, whatever. Thanks for watching uh, and goodbye for now.